Welcome everyone to today's third and final session of the USDA Day of Action, Preventing Cancer One Bite at a Time. I'm Shavonda Jacobs-Jung, Undersecretary for Research, Education and Economics and USDA Chief Scientist. This is a virtual one and a half hour roundtable on integrating best practices for adoption and engaging with USDA programs. This session has an especially important purpose. I like to say knowledge is power and implementation is success. We talked this morning about all of the amazing science produced through USDA. That science doesn't reach its full potential if it's not translated into action in our communities and our homes. Today's panel will showcase USDA and partner programs that increase community adoption of healthy eating and lifestyles, both of which have been shown to reduce cancer risk. Part of USDA's efforts in the Cancer Moonshot are about preventing cancer through healthy foods. Getting those nutritious foods to the people who need them is of paramount importance. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Dion Toombs, who will moderate this session. And I'm delighted to welcome each of the outstanding panelists who will be taking part today. Dr. Toom is acting director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, USDA's external grant funding agency for agriculture research, education, and extension programs across the nation. Dr. Toombs, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs Young, and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this roundtable discussion. I am so excited to hear from our speakers today, and I am honored to serve as acting director for NIFA and continue our legacy in providing leadership and funding for programs that advance agriculture-related sciences through teaching, research, and extension. The NIFA team is honored to be a part of the USDA Cancer Prevention Day of Action in support of President Biden's Cancer Moonshot. During this session, we will showcase several USDA partner programs and best practices that increase community adoption of healthy eating and lifestyles, both of which have been shown to prevent cancer. You will hear from experts whose work is making a vital difference locally in their communities and throughout the country. Cancer, whether experienced personally or with a family member, has impacted virtually every American family in one way or another. USDA NIFA is proud to be working together towards President Biden's goal of cutting the death rate from cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years and improving the experience of individuals and their families who are living with and surviving cancer. Before our speakers share their remarks, I would like to tell you a little more about the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and what our role in this quest may be. NIFA is a part of USDA's research, education, and economics mission area that administers federal funding to the nation's land-grant universities and other organizations to address food and agriculture issues impacting the lives of people every day and the nation's future. There are 112 land-grant universities, at least one in every state and U.S. territory, who operate more than 600 agriculture experiment stations with more than 13,000 scientists. Each land-grant university also has a cooperative extension program that delivers discoveries from universities to the people who can put them into practice. There are about 2,900 extension offices in local communities serving the people nationwide. Our programs propel cutting edge discoveries from research laboratories to farms, classrooms, communities, and back again. We collaborate with leading scientists, policymakers, experts, and educators and organizations
I'm afraid Dr. Toombs may have lost her broadband. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Chester if she'd be willing to step in here for just a moment. Okay, thank you. As it relates to community adoption of healthy eating and lifestyles, NIFA recognizes nutrition as a proactive, cost-effective approach to address many of the societal, environmental, and economic issues faced across the world today. We work to ensure a safe, nutritious, and secure food supply while also developing, delivering, and disseminating evidence-based nutrition education and promotion to prevent chronic diseases, improve health, and prioritize nutrition security. Some of our cornerstone nutrition programs include the Community Food Projects Competitive Grants Program, which fights food insecurity through developing community food projects that help promote the self-sufficiency of low-income communities. The Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, or FNEP, is the nation's first nutrition education program for low-income populations and remains at the forefront of nutrition education efforts to reduce nutrition insecurity of low-income families and youths today. The Food Safety, Nutrition, and Health Program area of our Agriculture and Food Research Initiative Foundational and Applied Science Program was established to provide the scientific foundation for addressing public demands for safe and nutritious food. It uses a transdisciplinary approach to define previously unrealized opportunities for improving food safety, quality, and nutrition along the value chain. NIFA's food and agricultural service learning programs are increasing knowledge of agriculture and helping improve the nutritional health of children. And the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, or GUSNIP, is increasing the purchase of fresh fruits and vegetables by low-income consumers, in turn improving the health and nutrition of participating households. These examples illustrate NIFA's support of health and nutrition initiatives that have been shown to have a positive impact on cancer prevention. From applied research on the cancer-fighting benefits of fruits and vegetables to extension and education efforts addressing the diet, health, and equity issues impacting chronic disease, NIFA programs are reaching people across the lifespan. Our investment plays a critical role in building the evidence base and translating the evidence into action that helps ensure all Americans have access to safe, nutritious, and affordable foods. Now, on to our roundtable discussion. Let's hear from some of our partners who work, whose work is having a notable impact. And as a reminder, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will share questions after each speaker has given their remarks. Our first speaker is Dr. Mary Marimi. Dr. Marimi is a professor of nutrition in the College of Human Sciences at Texas Tech University. She has a broad background in nutrition with specific training and expertise in assessing dietary habits among low-income populations and implementing behavior-focused projects. She teaches online graduate courses on nutrition education methods, international nutrition, and community nutrition, among others. Her research interests include understanding the effects of the community environment on the nutrition status of the residents and identifying coping strategies for food insecurity and factors that influence dietary behaviors especially among low-income populations. Similarly, Dr. Marimi applies an ecological approach and train the trainer model in her community-based participatory research. She has conducted community-wide outreach projects aimed at behavior modification in the prevention of obesity and the related chronic diseases among rural residents of Northern Louisiana. 
Please welcome Dr. Marini. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And can my slides progress? Next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say are the risk factors and causes of cancers. And some of the work we do, especially those who have been funded by USDA in the community uh, addressing chronic diseases. So as we all know, cancer is the second leading cause of death globally. However, more than 60% of new cancer cases and associated deaths occur in developing countries. Despite the growth, cancers is underestimated, underreported, and undermanaged. Lung cancer is the most common cancer, followed by the breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and stomach cancers. All these cancers are lifestyle and nutrition related and preventable if identified and treated early. Next slide. It is very important the community, uh, one of our principles at the community practice is to understand the risk factors. And that we do by assessing the needs and the conditions for us to uh, modify the behaviors. As we all know, cancerous cells divide uncontrollably, negatively affecting host tissues. Risk factors for cancers include lifestyle behaviors, genetic factors, dietary practices, infections, environmental and occupational exposure, among others. Lifestyle related, I, I'm sorry, I'm still on the other slide. I'm sorry, we are going in the wrong direction. Thank you. So lifestyle related uh, fact factors include smoking, alcohol consumption, dietary habits, and related weight status, virus, and other infections. Environmental and occupational factors include air pollution and exposure to industrial carcinogens. Next slide. For example, high fat diet is related or associated to breast and colon cancers, while a low fiber diet is associated with intestinal cancers. Smoked fish and beef con consumption or excessive uh, red meat associated with stomach and bowel cancers uh, respectively. Alcohol consumption is associated with esophageal and liver cancers. Smoking or chewing tobacco is associated with lung, pharynx, esophagus, blender, pancreas, and mouth cancers. Occupational exposure to chemical substances such as arsenic, asbestos, and other associated with are, are, are associated with cancers of various organs. Environmental, uh, like air pollution, sunlight, and radiation are associated with skin, oral, and leukemia cancers. Next slide, please. Now that we have associated the risk factors and the lifestyle cancers, how can we stop cancer before it starts? We all know once it starts, it's sometimes very uncontrollable. Like the practice we do in community, the most important thing is to start with assessing the magnitude, uh, develop strategy based on assessment, and then set priorities and measurable objectives. For example, it's critical that we identify the most common type of cancer in a particular community or region. And one region may be aff afflicted by one cancer, but not the other. Identifying the most vulnerable population in that community by eth ethnicity, age, or gender in each community. So identifying the risk factors for the common type of cancers and the vulnerable population, we have tools to uh, to control it after. Identify cancer-related health literacy for a given community. Establish basic cancer knowledge and find the misconceptions at the community level. 
After that, we can open channels of cancer-related communication through community-based groups and gatekeepers, eliminating fear. Next slide, please. So once we have those tools, we know what is affecting most, most people. We know the, the, the population that is affected. It's important to, to combat cancer systematically because knowing the symptoms might save their lives. The primary or at the individual level is to develop the culture of prevention by increasing awareness on cancer-related risk factors as we have just talked about increase awareness on the relationship between those risk factors and the common cancers in each community, increasing awareness of early symptoms, and this would be as a prompt for screening. After we, we, we saturate the information or the community with that awareness, then it's important to realize that there are some things community people, even if they know, they can't do. This is where the government and the local government comes in. Legislative measures to reduce or control air pollution, legislative measures to protect workers from occupational risk factors, legislative measures to control the promotion of, of cancer-causing agents whether we sell them or we are exposed to them. At the secondary level, it's important to develop access to affordable screening sites. At the community, we have people that are challenged with education, with knowledge, with health literacy. Others are challenged by income. And so we need to uh, make it affordable and accessible. And at the tertiary level, affordable and accessible early diagnosis and treatment. Next slide, please. So early diagnosis is where we left in, make screening accessible for early diagnosis, develop multi-skilled, culture-sensitive teams that will include nurses, doctors, dietitians, behavior scientists, psycholog uh, psychologists, and counselors. Cancer comes with a baggage of fear, of shame, uh, of hopelessness. And so we need a team that can address all those. Increase cancer awareness by educating the community again on risk factors, the symptoms now, and the importance of early diagnosis and treatment. We all need to be aware that most of the symptoms of cancer are like any other. Somebody might just feel like they have a flu or they are tired. And so we need to let our people know not to ignore those uh, symptoms. Applying the principles of equity by making cancer diagnosis and screening affordable to low income population. Increase access to testing and address fear of testing results. I worked with the community and I cannot tell you how many to people told me, if I test that I have cancer, so what? What will I do? Uh, improve health literacy through cultural sensitive education. What do they understand? What do they value? What do they like? What do they fear? Next slide, please. Cancer prevention strategies we again what we have uh, summarizing what we have just said we need a systematic prevention of cancer requires community outreach with extensive awareness messages affordable and accessible early detection effective prevention initiates should target smoking cessation and start early efforts and early immunization if possible because of the infections nutrition education that promotes fruit and vegetable uh, vegetables consumption in and moderation in fat, sugar, and red and processed foods. Promotion of lifestyle behaviors that include increased physical activity and maintenance of normal weight. Development of cultural and health literacy, sensitive training programs. Next slide. So the goals of reducing cancer in the community include keeping the healthy people healthy by building that culture that supports a healthy lifestyle. Building the culture means you we give them the tools. 
making healthy lifestyle the preferred choice in the community after we assess what their values are. Understanding that cancer magnitude by continuous assessment, understanding the cancer magnitude uh, by continuous assessment, the fact that we assessed a year ago, we don't know what is happening now. Understanding what drives unhealthy and healthy behaviors so that we can address those. Provide people with tools and information to make healthy choices in a way they can understand and identify with. Saturate the message by engaging multiple sectors of a community such as schools, churches, neighborhoods, after school programs and clinics to just mention a few. Improving treatment and health management of those diagnosed with cancer by making them partners in, in healing. Next slide, please. So again, as we come to best practices of reducing causes of cancer, we need to develop policies and environmental approaches to capture everybody and make healthy choices available, affordable, and easy to access. Develop educational programs to, inf to inform healthy lifestyle decisions. <laughs> Develop a healthy social and cultural values that will guide and govern community thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. Develop social and physical environments that positively influence health with a range of healthy options that are accessible, <clears throat> attractive, and easy to use. Address a societal determinants of health to prevent or delay the development, the development of cancer disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marimi. Our next speaker is Dr. Lexi McMillan Uribe. Dr. McMillan Uribe is an assistant professor for the Texas A&M AgriLife Institute for Advancing Health Through Agriculture. She was a postdoctoral fellow for the Maternal and Child Nutrition Training Grant at Cornell University. She is also a registered dietitian. Her research focuses on increasing healthy food access and promoting healthy lifestyles in food insecure communities through community informed interventions. Please welcome Dr. McMillan Uribe. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and the opportunity to be here. Um, so next slide, please. Great, um, we'll just go ahead to the next slide too. Um, to start off, I wanted to um, talk about the institute for which I work for, um, the Texas A&M AgriLife Institute for Advancing Health, otherwise known as IHA. So this is the world's first academic institute to bring together precision nutrition, responsive agriculture, and social and behavior, behavioral research to reduce diet-related chronic disease and lower healthcare costs in a way that supports producers, consumers, and the environment. There are three programs, um, Precision Nutrition, Responsive Agriculture, and Healthy Living, which represents the social and behavioral research side. Next slide, please. So looking at the Healthy Living Program specifically, um, its mission is to engage people in the communities in which they work, live, uh, work, live and play to implement health promotion programs that are relevant, acceptable, and tailored to their personal, sociocultural, community, and environmental context. Uh, please, thank you. Its vision is to positively affect community and population level health behavior and health behavior outcomes using cost-effective, sustainable strategies with particular attention to rural and underserved groups and to lead the translation of these new discoveries from IHA's Responsive Agriculture and Precision Nutrition Hubs to other hubs of the IHA to the community setting. Next slide, please. And I apologize, um, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. Um, the slides um, 
we had some issues uh, for, with the slides transferring over, so um, I will do my best, but some of my titles aren't totally there, So, um, but we will um, make the best of this. So um, before I talk about the IHA's current portfolio of programs um, that decrease cancer risk, I wanted to draw your attention to the World Cancer Research Fund, American Institute for um, Cancer Research, Cancer Prevention Recommendations. And as you may notice, um, six out of the eight of these recommendations are diet. Um, please progress the slides. Um, so because of this, the IHA Healthy Living Program has focused on improving diet quality um, in uh, low-income populations. And many of our programs also focused on increasing physical activity. Next slide, please. Our programs also use a community-informed research approach where we're engaging community members and key stakeholders at key research phases, which are represent, it's represented by this inner circle here. And by doing this, engaging community members and increasing, uh, engaging community members and stakeholders, you will increase the rigor, reach, and relevance of your study. Next slide, please. So now I wanted to highlight some of IHA's healthy living programs that aim to improve um, diet quality, uh, therefore reducing cancer risk. So the first of these programs are the Change Club Civic Engagement Study, in which participants engaged in making health-related changes to their community. So this was a multi-level, multi-component intervention to improve cancer risk factors. So it was multi-level because not only did it focus on individual behavior change, but also looked at health changes in the social and the built environment. So in this study, 2,000 participants um, in 12 medically underserved rural counties will be recruited and baseline will, uh, measures will be collected in 2022 with a three-year follow-up. So this program is going to be adapted um, into an intervention that fosters leadership for rural librarians looking at cardiometabolic health outcomes, and one intervention that fosters leadership for middle school students that looks at diet and physical activity behavior change. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we also um, are involved in adapting evidence-based programs. So one of these programs is the Strong People's Programs, which is a collection of evidence-based healthy eating and or physical activity intervention programs that was originally tested with rural at-risk women. We will be adapting this program for rural Latinx women, urban populations, and for digital delivery. Finally, we, um, are involved in several programs that incentivize fruit and vegetable consumption. One of these programs is Farm Fresh Foods for Healthy Kids. So this is a multi-state randomized control trial of a cost offset community supported agriculture program. So individuals are receiving share, weekly shares of fruits and vegetables from local farms um, for a reduced cost. And this was paired with education and done with rural low-income households with children. The results of this study showed improvements in food security and diet quality among the caregivers, but um, not among the children. And this may have been due to the study duration, which may have been inadequate to foster changes in the children. So we have urban projects um, of the Farm Fresh Foods for Healthy Kids that are forthcoming within the Institute. We also have the IHA Healthy Living Produce um, Prescription Study or the Produce RX Study. This study, in this study, healthcare providers will prescribe weekly fruit and vegetable allotments um, paired with education. Um, and we have two interventions that we are piloting using this approach, one with um, toddler caregiver diets and another with adults who have at least one chronic disease risk factor. We'll look at 12 week changes in BMI, um, a measure of weight, metabolic syndrome and fruit and vegetable intake. So the key features of this program that are adding to the evidence base for uh, produce prescription programs is that it will be a randomized control trial. So it'll be a little more rigorous than what we are currently seeing in the literature. We'll look at clinical outcome measures like metabolic syndrome 
And we are um, doing this as a multi-sector partnership. So we're partnering with food banks, local clinics, and the city of Dallas. Next slide, please. So in thinking of um, best practices as informed by the studies that we're doing, and um, this is not um, an exhaustive list, um, we found that it's important to identify partners who provide key services and leverage these key services. For example, we work a lot with Cooperative Extension, which has a myriad of health education programs. And we are also, uh, for the Produce Prescription Program, working with the North Texas Food Bank to procure fruits and vegetables. Um, also, clinic services that are already being um, delivered to at-risk groups are important to consider for future interventions. Um, also, it's important to go beyond individual level factors to look at multi-level, multi-sector interventions, um, such as looking at social factors or the um, institutions um, or the environment that might, um, that might influence health and uh, thus cancer risk as well. And finally, um, it's important to enhance interventions with linguistically and culturally appropriate audience-specific nutrition education, which has been shown in the research to be more effective. Next slide, please. Finally, in thinking of um, future endeavors for uh, the IHA Healthy Living Program, we're interested in evaluating and adapting evidence-based programs on cancer and obesity outcomes. Currently, the research um, is really only looking at short-term outcomes such as diet quality and not long-term outcomes such as cancer or obesity incidence. Um, we are also interested in looking at novel programs for increasing access and consumption of fruits and vegetables, which is related to decreased cancer prevention, such as providing meal kits. Um, we're also interested in programs that are going to leverage stronger linkages between producers and local food systems and consumers via clinics, food programs, and retail environments. Um, look at real-time fruit and vegetable education, shopping and meal planning support that are occurring within the retail space. Um, conduct more cost and cost effectiveness analyses with specific program features. Um, improving dietary assessment and measures as we see that current dietary assessment measures are either very burdensome for participants participants or they lack accuracy or both. And finally, um, we want to look at cohort studies with embedded interventions that are that is, and this is especially important for cancer prevention because cancer is really a long-term outcome. So in conducting future cohort and intervention studies, we will be utilizing mobile health assessment centers. Next slide, please. So these mobile health assessment centers that are pictured in this slide are going to allow us to collect data and deliver interventions in communities that may be facing barriers to accessing services, such as in rural communities or some urban areas. Next slide, please. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, if you'd like to contact us, uh, please email our associate director, Rebecca Segan Fowler at r.segan. Uh, dash Fowler at ag.tamu.edu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McMillan Uribe. Dr. Ellen Aaron Yellen is our next speaker. Dr. Yellen is an associate professor of gerontology, cooperative extension specialist, and interim director of the Center on Aging at Kansas State University. Dr. Yellen studies the social determinants of health particularly within the context of well-being and healthy aging and pursues community-based interventions that aim to improve the lives of older adults. She served on the leadership team who helped to develop the new cooperative extension framework on health equity and well-being. Please welcome Dr. Yellen. Thank you so much. It is such an honor and privilege to be talking with you today about gerontological interventions and partnerships that support cancer prevention and overall well being, as well as the National Cooperative Extension Model of Health Equity and Well Being. 
So to begin, I want to quickly lay the stage of, of why older adults are so important in cancer prevention efforts. Age is a significant risk factor for cancer, with adults over the age of 65 representing 60% of all new malignancies and 70% of cancer deaths. Looking a bit deeper, the age-adjusted cancer incident rate is 2,151 per 100,000 people for those over the age of 65, compared to just 208 per, per 100,000 people for those under 65. Therefore, despite society's pervasive ageist beliefs and actions, this is a population that cannot be ignored and is critical to support in our cancer prevention and well being initiatives. Next. So, in response to this incredible need, the existing gerontological focus of extension supported and other partner programs is so rich and exciting. There's so much to showcase, and I've chosen only a few programs and partnerships to highlight. All of these, though, place a very strong emphasis on healthy eating, physical activity, and overall healthy lifestyles, which in turn has great influence on healthy aging across the lifespan and, of course, cancer prevention. Ranging from public health models that increase physical activity, such as the Community Healthy Activities Program, also called CHAMPS, to the national extension work groups, such as Dining with Diabetes, the North Central Region Aging Network, and the Adult Development and Aging Work Group that was established within USDA NIFA, all the way to multi-session research and evidence-based programs, such as Keys to Embracing Aging, Chronic Disease Self-Management Education, Stay Strong, Stay Healthy. There's such a plethora of educational opportunities and interventions that Extension has led, participated in, and partnered with. And of course, we cannot do this alone. Through incredible federal and national partnerships with the Alzheimer's Association, Robert Wood, USDA NIFA, down to local departments, senior centers, long-term care facilities, Meals on Wheels, and area agencies on aging. There's so many partners that value and support Extension's role in cancer prevention, and they are always eager to partner and support. Next slide. So whether it's in the programs and partnerships that I just mentioned, or any other amazing initiative that Extension is involved in, we need to keep in mind several best practices in the gerontological space and beyond. First, we need to embrace and reach diverse audiences. And I implore you, this is not a check the box situation. This requires strategic, purposeful, and even uncomfortable forms of outreach to communities that are vastly different from you and I, and are vastly different from the audiences that Extension has historically reached. We need to do better. And some of the opportunities that are repeatedly missed among the gerontological population are those individuals that are homebound, isolated, and live in incredibly rural and frontier areas, as well as the oldest old individuals, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the LGBTQIA plus populations. And all of this requires trust that must be built among the various entities and stakeholders, which can include family within and among our communities and care providers among so many more. And we must focus on consistent contact with the education that we are providing. We can never make significant change through lunch and learns and one-offs. We have a duty to regularly engage and support the sustainability of our interventions and initiatives. And finally, we must explore new and alternative ways to reach our audiences and do so in non-ageist ways. Believe it or not, many older adults actually know how to use technology and reaching these audiences through virtual interventions can have a significant impact on healthy living across the lifespan. We must continue to learn and grow. Next slide. Thank you.
So in addition to these best practices, we must continue to broaden our work and work to address these wicked issues such as health equity. The Cooperative Extension National Framework for Health Equity and Well-Being provides a clear, comprehensive roadmap for redesigning our work. With a focus on health equity, which is defined as improving population health and achieving equity in health status, this model emphasizes the key determinants and processes for improving the health and well-being of individuals at all stages of life. This includes addressing the social determinants of health through policy systems and environmental changes, utilizing coalitions and community health assets to promote, establish, and support health-related work, and working to purposefully and strategically address the isms that plague our society and serve as the true root causes of structural inequity, such as racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, ableism, and so much more. Next. So as you can see, many of these recommendations in this visual representation of the model are here. On the fish tail, as we like to call it, on the left-hand side, we emphasize five high-level recommendations for achieving health equity and extension, including promoting health as a system-wide value, integrating science with resident voice, supporting extension programs and professionals, accomplishing work through partnerships and coalitions, and utilizing community development principles and practices. For these high level recommendations, we can begin to address all of those things that we see on the right hand side, including those root causes of structural inequity, making substantial improvements in norms, policies, and practices that can either support or hinder our well being, address the social determinants of health, such as access to healthy food, um, improving our health systems and services, and income and wealth. And to make progress in these areas, we must continue to engage in strategic actions that aim to identify and address health disparities. Two mechanisms through which this can happen in extension include creating healthy communities through collective action and promoting healthy behaviors through communication and education. Together, all of these purposeful and powerful steps will ultimately work to improve the equity of health in our country and beyond. So thank you. Dr. Toombs, I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Yellen. Next, we will hear from Heidi Rader. Ms. Rader promotes health, wellness, and self-sufficiency through education on local foods and agriculture throughout Alaska and has worked extensively with tribes in interior Alaska through the Tribes Extension Program. She teaches workshops on these topics and offers the Alaska Master Gardener online course. She also writes monthly news columns in the summer, which are posted on the It Grows in Alaska blog and has filmed over 50 YouTube videos for a series called In the Alaska Garden with Heidi Rader. She also co-directs the Vegetable Variety Trials in Fairbanks, Alaska. Please welcome Ms. Rader. Thank you, Dr. Toombs. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so the Alaska Tribes Extension Program is committed to giving priority to and making space for indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in all outreach efforts and supporting food sovereignty um, and food security throughout the 229 federally recognized tribes we have here in Alaska. Next slide, please. And I'd like to acknowledge the Alaska Native Nations where I live and work um, on the Trothyeta campus here in Fairbanks, Alaska, the traditional lands of the Dana people. So this work is funded through NEFA, through the Alaska, the federally recognized tribes extension program. Next slide, please. And I've worked extensively in interior Alaska, which is about the size of Texas, but um, beginning to serve tribes statewide through increased funding and, and networks and through 
COVID with the increased virtual options we have now. So the focus of this program is multi-platform outreach, whether that's hands-on, virtual, um, social media, YouTube, blogs, any type of media we can use to reach tribes because many of them are located off the road system. Um, and the focus is any healthy behaviors, whether that's gardening, traditional methods of food gathering, hunting, fishing, preser preserving foods, it is all supported by this program. And next slide, please. Not only bringing knowledge from extension educators, but also supporting traditional knowledge bearers and, and, and inviting them to participate in all of our outreach efforts as well. And a big focus too is that it's not just what is on your plate that you're eating, all of the behaviors that go into cooking, preserving, harvesting, tool making is really what culture is about. And there's so many healthy behaviors that go into gathering the berries with your family. Um, you're getting exercise, you're building memories, you're building community. And so whether it's gardening or picking blueberries, we support the holistic aspect of those activities. Next, next slide, please. And, and with COVID, there's been a lot of changes in the availability of wild foods, both due to COVID and climate change. And the, it's forcing tribes to look at alternative sources of food. And so we're supporting those um, efforts to garden as well as, as there's been a large salmon collapse on the Yukon River and it's forcing people to look at alternatives. This is an example of a recent series this was a virtual series of six webinars taught by Molly Caridwin and our nutrition educator. And Molly is a Yupik traditional healer and using all kinds of traditional knowledge. Next slide, please. These are just examples of healthy workshops we teach, both virtual workshops on gardening, skiing, growing, uh, preserving food, all kinds of healthy activities. Next slide, please. Um, much of our workshops is focused on introducing new skills, providing the education needed to start new habits. Once you start a garden, you're not only getting exercise when you grow the garden and water it, harvest, um, it's also an opportunity to build community with the community garden. Next slide. This is an example of a social media campaign. Um, although gardening may not have been traditional uh, thousands of years ago, it is becoming a new tradition in many villages. And so we're encouraging that. Next slide. Um, and it, one of the big reasons to grow a garden in a remote village is many villages are located off the road system. And by the, by the time fresh produce is received, it's often rotten or far past its prime. So on the next slide, you can see an example of that. Oh, maybe that was taken out. Um, you, you can go to the next one. But the, the most common foods in rural stores are non-perishable items and produce is rare and it's often not fresh. Um, whether it's an individual or a community garden, studies have shown that if people garden in a community garden, they're more likely to eat fruits and vegetables. They're more likely to preserve it. They're more likely to share it. Um, and so those are all good habit forming activities when you, when you start a garden. This is where I have a blog, It Grows in Alaska. Um, articles are also written for the local newspaper as well as the tribal newsletter. So again, we're using many different methods to reach tribes. Next slide, please. Another program that I'm involved in, I'm on the board of the Alaska Food Policy Council and co-chair of the Indigenous Foods Group. So we're working to address policy 
policies that encourage food security, as well as healthy eating behaviors. So all of these have been talked about before, but how diet and physical inactivity relate to chronic disease. And that's the Alaska Food Policy Council. Next slide, please. Some of the um, evaluations of the tribe's extension program have shown, um, you know, people are starting gardens after participating in workshops. They are sharing produce. Some are even starting farms. They may start community or tribal gardens. Um, and diets are also being improved by, by the programs and services we offer to tribes. Next slide, please. A lot, of, uh, a lot more information on these websites about the programs we offer and the tribes that we're reaching. Um, I've, as was said earlier, I have filmed over 50 YouTube videos and not only is that reaching tribes, that's also reaching many other Alaskans. Um, and you can find out more information on all of these websites. Thank you. turn it over to Dr. Toombs now. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Rader. Our final speaker today is Dr. Fatima Malikian. Dr. Malikian is a professor of food science, director of the Institute of Food, Nutrition, and Wellness, and project director for the Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness, and Quality of Life at Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She has been the director and co-director of a number of projects funded by USDA, FDA, and other agencies. Her research focuses on food, nutrition, and physical activities, obesity, and obesity-related diseases, non-traditional meats such as rabbits and goats, product development, chemical analysis of foods, stability, processing, packaging, and food safety. Dr. Malikian provides training and leadership support for extension professionals and paraprofessionals and other individuals throughout Louisiana. Prior to joining Southern University, Dr. Malikian worked at Pennington Biomedical Research Center as the Food Analysis Laboratory Director for 12 years. Please welcome Dr. Malikian. Thank you so much, Dr. Tung, and uh, this is an honor to be here and present to you all. Uh, the introduction has been uh, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. And if you all don't know where Southern University is, it's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, we have been talking all day about all all the information and general information that we have been, uh, you know, researching and working on related to nutrition and cancer. And we know it's a very complicated issue. It's not something that we can overcome in one day or so. So research has pointed towards certain foods and nutrients that may help prevent, or it can contribute to obesity. Uh, and obesity related diseases. And at the same time, we know that obesity causes some types of cancer. Many factors cannot be changed. And, and you know, it's just like genetic, we cannot change it. Hopefully in the future, there are ways that we can even go to the gene. And uh, it is when you do have your gene mapping, there have been some procedures and research that they would be able to uh, kind of play with some of the genes, but it's not, finalized and is, I am sure it's ongoing research and environment. Those are the things that is hard to change, but there are things that we can control. The things that we can, you know, even not only in the United States, but globally, when you look at the World Health Organization, 17 people die every minute from cancer. That is a huge number. It adds up to 8.8 .8 million. It was at 2020. 
around 22% of these cancer-related deaths have been triggered by predisposing factors such as unhealthy lifestyle. We know that we have been talking about it. Its number has increased almost 33, over one third and excessive alcohol consumption and smoking. Obesity is linked to a higher risk, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of so many cancers, such as cancer of breast, colon cancer, rectum, endometrium, esophagus, kidney, pancreatic cancer, and gut bladder. And as you, as you will, uh, look at the pie chart, you would see that at least more than 30% of the contributing factors is about alcohol, being overweight or obese, physically inactive, and diet. Next slide, please. So bringing you, all of you to Louisiana, the beautiful state of Louisiana, we can see that the uh, cancer sites for the different cancers in Louisiana compared to USA, these are the numbers that have been age adjusted and it's the numbers of the cancer per 100,000 people. For example, a couple of samples, if you look at the numbers, the numbers are lower than national, but some of them such as brain and other nervous system, um, it's lower, bladder is a little bit lower, but when it comes uh, to breast cancer, to lung cancer, and then uh, the one that I wanna bring your attention is prostate cancer in male. The numbers are very high in some of the categories. Next slide, please. So if we look at this map, the top map shows that uh, the number of uh, African communities that they have been, you know, uh, participated in this uh, in this data, and these are from year 2011 to 2015, and we know that these numbers have changed, has increased, and then the bottom map shows that uh, the community that they have, you know, they are um, they are they are living below poverty and. Uh, and about 30 to 100 percent, you will see that this is scattered. But at the same time, as I said, the numbers I'm sure has increased since 2015. Next slide, please. So, if we think or talk about the ranking in Louisiana, we know that Louisiana nationally ranks second uh, after pandemic, especially in food insecurity, ninth in hunger, filled household and one of the top 10 states in obesity. And young children under age of 12 and elderly have been hard hit. Louisiana has the seventh highest cancer rate. And when we look at the bottom, when it comes to consumption of fruits and vegetables, which is the healthy option, we are number 48. As I said, these numbers may have changed. We may have ranked higher or lower, um, but adults, they are not eating vegetable. High school students, the same way, fruits and vegetables. And when you look at the graph, you see that Mississippi is number one in food insecurity after pandemic. We all know that pandemic had affected a lot on underserved communities, especially. And the number of deaths because of pandemic in those communities was drastically higher than other communities. Louisiana is number two. And as I, you all see, majority of these states are in the Southern region. Next slide, please. So what are the factors? I'm not, you know, I, I'm sure I haven't talked about or captured all the factors. These are the ones that we all know somehow contributes to this um, uh, mysterious or complicated disease. Racial discrimination, obesity and obesity related diseases such as, obese, uh, such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, et cetera, hunger, we know that uh, a lot of a number of people are going hungry, and uh, you know the, the food access is difficult. Health illiteracy, even if they go to the doctor, they are not familiar with the terms that the doctor use, so they come and just take the medication without knowing why 
they are taking it, food deserts. We have areas in Louisiana that they don't have access to a grocery store. And uh, when we talk about those stores, we say, well, grocery store is not those discounted store that is in every corn corner of underserved communities. They don't have produce. They have the high calorie foods and people buy it because that's the only thing that they have access to. Medical insurance, of course not all the people, especially underserved community have medical insurance, lack of screening for food insecurity. How many times or how many doctors you have heard that they screen people or medical professional for insecurity? There are two questions that they can ask. If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then you know that person is food insecure and you can after you know uh, identifying that, you can refer them to government agencies that they are providing nutrition education. They are providing incentives such as uh, WIC programs, such as SNAP aid, and other programs. Um, cancer Alley, environmental. There is an area uh, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. It's about 85 miles, and this area is close to all the chemical companies and all the refineries and the people who live there, majority of them have lung cancer. They have 45,000 people. They're either coughing or they have a uh, reaction. And that's not just the blood. That's why they call it cancer alley. They, in 1980s, they would call it chemical corridor because it was all about chemicals. And the smoking and drinking, of course, we know. Um, we say everything in moderation. Uh, next slide, please. So what are uh, we thinking about possible solution? A screening for food insecurity by medical profession, human right approach for providing sustainable healthy foods, decreasing food waste. We and um, farmers, uh, food producer, food processors, they throw away a lot of food which we could use those, we could uh, give it to the food bank, we could uh, make it a value added product, which we have been doing a little bit at a time at our university, but you know, it takes a lot of people and a lot of funding. Supporting capacity building for communities to achieve their own food and nutrition security. University community partnership is crucial especially universities that they are close to the underserved community. Align university resources and structures for conducting research strategies that cross many disciplinary boundaries to create a holistic approach and educate the new generation of students to be uh, the, the problem solver and to be the ambassadors of health. Like for example, this beautiful pictures is an example. If we can get all our students and children to do this, then we the next generation would be healthier. Next slide, please. So we were very fortunate at Southern University Axenet with two other university in the Southern region, Tuskegee University, North Carolina, a and State University, and help of 1890 University Foundation to receive funding from USD and NEPA and uh, start the Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness, and Quality of Life. Under this center, we have brought a collaborators. We have done a lot of work so far. That was, this is our second year, but in the first year, you know, it was a lot of learning lesson. But our mission for this center is the 1890 Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness, and Quality of Life seeks to support the triple land grant mission of research, teaching, and extension to contribute solution to improve the health and well-being of underserved and minority population. In our research arena, we are doing uh, research on microbiome, microbiota. And it had, uh, to my knowledge, it, uh, this research hasn't been done in underserved and African Americans. So with this research, um, we are gonna you know, have baseline data and compare it to others and move on and find out what is the relationship between microbiota and the digestion, digestion system and obesity. 
and the area of teaching, our students are involved in every aspect of Center of Excellence. They come with us, they shadow the scientists, and we all learn at the same time. And if we make mistakes, we learn from our mistakes. And the area of extension, we have been providing nutrition education uh, to underserved community, to multi-state, as I said earlier, with innovative nutrition object, uh, outreach program. The program that we are using is Sisters Together program. Next slide, please. Which is a nationally recognized program. We do nutrition education, cooking demonstration, physical activity, and other nutrition programs as we see to it, we do it based on the community needs. We work closely with our small farmers in all the parishes in Louisiana. Why we do that? Because we want to connect our community to the farmers. We want to bring those farmers to the farmer's market. And uh, we train them on safety. We want to make sure when we promote produce safety, we want to promote the safety of those produce as well. We train the, the farmers to provide produce that is safe for everybody to use. We work closely with Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank. The farmers can give the extra fruits and vegetables to food bank. They can give it to homeless shelter. They can give it to uh, areas that people don't have produce. There is a program here, Mayor uh, Healthy Baton Rouge Community Gardens. We work with them closely. We have done, we have chosen a community that we are working under Center of Excellence, provided back yard gardens with the community. We do hydroponic and uh, aquaponic. So uh, the community members know that there is another way of gardening. They don't have to come out. You know, the weather in Louisiana is not that friendly and we have a lot of rain and we get a uh, tornado, we get hurricanes. So if we can, we can teach our community members to do gardening inside, that would be wonderful. And they are enjoying that vertical gardening actually. We are using technology, we are using, um, LENA AI, which is artificial intelligence. We have done uh, all the participants in our program downloaded this app on their phone. They have 24 hours access to all the things that they need, the numbers, the food that they wanna buy, the ingredients that they wanna buy, connected to uh, Walmart um, and the other stuff, fresh market and uh, farmer's market in Baton Rouge. So they can you know, just ask for what the, it is there to order it, go pick it up, or that delivery is available to be delivered to them. As you see, a lot of gardening we do even with the school children. Next slide, please. So with all the things that we talked about, I know we talked about a lot about equity versus equality, but equity is not the same, you know, it's not diversity. We are not talking about that. Diversity means variety. Equity is not inclusion. Inclusion means representation. Equity is not equality. Equality means sameness. So you all know what this picture is saying. When we are talking about equity, we mean that everybody should have the vehicle or the things that they need to reach the apple and this picture, for example. We know the people who have everything, they can get everything. So uh, equity is the floor beneath which no one should fall. So we need to provide everything that is needed for everybody. As Dr. Catherine Young and our uh, Secretary uh, of Agriculture, Secretary Wiltsak said this morning, we all need to work together. This is not a one person or one university or uh, you know one group. We all need to get to work together and you know have representative. That's what I want to make sure that we, we, we should have more representative from underserved communities, the community, uh, the heart of community, we should have more representative from those communities so they can speak out. So hopefully by 25 years from now, we can reach President Biden's charge to us and decrease the cancer by 50%. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Malikian. Of course.
We would now like to open this session for questions and discussion. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Serving as our discussant today is Dr. Angela Odoms-Young. Dr. Odoms-Young is an associate professor and director of the Food and Nutrition Education and Communities Program and the New York State Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program. In 2021, she joined the Cornell faculty after spending 13 years at the University of Illinois at Chicago in the Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition. Her research explores the social and structural determinants of dietary behaviors and related health outcomes in low income populations and black, indigenous, and people of color. Her work also centers on developing culturally responsive programs and policies that promote health equity, food justice, and community resilience. Please welcome Dr. Odoms Young. Thank you so much, Dr. Toombs. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Angela Odoms Young. I wanna thank the speakers for excellent, just uh, the presentations were excellent and really focused as we think about the cancer moonshot uh, cancer prevention and treatment and the role of diet in that. It is so important as uh, is a key initiative of, of USDA, uh, improving food and nutrition security, and particularly looking at food and nutrition uh, insecurity in those populations that have significant cancer risk. Uh, next slide, please. So we know, as was mentioned, several themes were highlighted. Just the, uh, the issue is, uh, as it relates to poor diet and diet-related risks and just uh, how these diet-related risks are root causes of uh, poor health outcomes, including cancer in the United States. Uh, current recommendations really have had a mixed impact on health and dietary habits at a population level. And so it's so critical uh, the initiatives that were mentioned, the interventions, the community-based programs, they're critical because they're at the center of dietary change and really population health change. We've had increase in healthcare costs uh, from chronic diseases. And so it's important that we think about uh, not using a one-size-fits-all. Fit, uh, and I know, as was mentioned in the previous talks, about precision nutrition and just the opportunities that we have to think more about public health recommendations to improve population health uh, that serve a variety of populations. Uh, next slide, please. So we've had long-standing evidence about the link between diet and cancer. Uh, and as I was mentioning that cancer, um, risk factors, including food and nutrition uh, insecurity, are particularly important when we think about the cancer moonshot. Uh, as was mentioned in the previous talks, neighborhood and context matter. And so we have uh, uh, several tools in the toolbox right now that are emerging uh, to really address a lot of these issues and bring innovation to the field, including implementation science. Uh, as was mentioned in previous the previous talks, just the importance of having a knowledgeable and diverse workforce and really keeping equity at the center of these initiatives, as well as ongoing stakeholder engagement and the importance of including people with the lived experience and being adaptable and flexible. Uh, next slide. So I would like to launch uh, our discussion and our question and answer um, part of the session. Uh, and right now, we please bring more questions into the chat. Um, we will start with a few questions, but we wanna hear from you. It's so important that your voice be heard. Uh, and so I wanna start with a few questions. Uh, first, this is for Dr. Oribe. Uh, you mentioned uh, with the initiatives that you have um, and uh, with this exciting uh, sort of bridge of bringing agriculture, nutrition, 
uh, looking at health equity, population health, precision nutrition, all of these intersecting. But one of the things that you talked about was leveraging the power of local libraries and librarians to really build uh, capacity at the community level. This is very intriguing when you think about how everyday people can play a role in the prevention of cancer uh, in our core institutions. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this came about? Well, um, I will probably have to defer that because um, I'm actually representing a lot of projects from a lot of different uh, researchers. And that one in particular wasn't um, my project, but is something that uh, Rebecca Segan Fowler, our Associate Director of Healthy Living, is taking on. So I encourage you to reach out to her if you want to learn more about that. But I'm um, just going back to Dr. Odom's Young point about really leveraging what is already in the community is really important and something that we are striving for in the programs that we're developing because a lot of these grassroots efforts that are uh, quite frankly rooted in the community and already know the community are already doing wonderful work and um, and it's really important that we're um, using that and evaluating that to create more robust sustainable programs that's, that will eventually inform policy. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, you, uh, hopefully as a follow-up, and I know you probably have a website or information uh, that's happening at the center, um, and maybe potentially we could share that because it sounds like there's a lot of activity there that maybe people can learn more about. Absolutely, um, we do have a website and I'd be happy to share that with um, the audience. Thanks so much. Uh, my next question is actually for Dr. Yellen. Um, you talked about just how important it is to think about older adults, particularly when we consider cancer. And just you mentioned all of those factors, really, when we think about equity and being at the center of this work. But one thing that we don't always think about is sort of that intersectionality. So race and age, um, so racism and looking at gender. And so can you talk a little bit more about what are the implications of thinking about intersectionality for cancer prevention and treatment, particularly when we, when we think about diet? That's a, a really great point. And talking about intersectionality is absolutely critical because none of these isms or major issues exist in a vacuum by, by any means. So um, I know when we're looking in the gerontological space about health inequities and things that we need to be tackling, you know, all of these things come together. So um, yeah, it, it's hard to provide like a absolute clear response because there's just so much that goes into it. And oftentimes we talk about it sort of as like this spider web approach. So like taking the issue at that very center and then starting to piece and parcel it out and seeing all of those things that are contributing because when we're talking about healthy living or cancer prevention or whatever it is, you know, it's not just hey, go for a walk. Like if you don't live in a safe neighborhood where you have a risk of, you know, getting shot bluntly, you know, you're not going to go for a walk. So how do we look at all of these parts? And it takes like purposeful reflection and really talking with people in order to do that. So it's just so important to keep all of those things in mind. And it, it's never a, a clear and easy answer, but we need to be, like I said, purposeful and, and strategic in doing so. Yeah, thank you. That's such an important point because we have to think about that direct education the direct support and recommendations, but we really also have to think about policy systems and environmental change. And I know that that's been a big focus I know of SNAP Ed and, and also uh, looking at emerging programs within USDA uh, that center on multiple levels, uh, not just that individual level. So I think that that's so important that you mentioned. And this actually brings me to Heidi because you talked about not just an individual level focus, you talked about a community level focus. And this becomes so important when we think about capacity building and having our tribal communities, uh, we have our indigenous ways of knowing and thinking about 
people being at the center of their own solutions. And so can you talk a little bit more about how you have bridged this work with tribal communities, which is just so phenomenal, and how you make sure you bridge that sort of maybe traditional scientific approaches with the science of community and that longstanding science within our tribal communities? Yeah, so Alaska is so unique in that we have the 229 tribes, and I'm working with some tribes or villages, we often call them, where there may only be 20 or 30 people living in a very remote community. Um, And then some of the other ones in interior Alaska are close to 500, and then across the state, we have some larger ones, but um, they're also unique and different. If you have just one successful gardener in a community that might um, model for others, oh, I could do this too. But some some places I was just in no attack. Um, I think there was one, one person growing at the tribe there in a greenhouse, but they used to have gardeners. And so, you know, having another person successfully gardening is is a way to show, oh, I can do that too. But also I've also often traveled out to a community and they've seen some of my YouTube videos and I like to showcase farmers or gardeners across the state who are being successful too, to show, um, you know, to show what's possible. We have, you know, such a big state. It's, It's, um, you know, more than twice the size of Texas. And you think of all the different microclimates, whether you're coastal or interior or northern Alaska. And so we just have so many different growing regions and figuring out what and how to grow is is important to that. Um, And working with tribes and traditional knowledge bearers, it's always, I'm always invited by tribes to come and share and, and my um, partners tradi- who are traditional knowledge bearers, I'm in, including them to, um, to showcase and, and you know, sh- showcase their knowledge as well and support their, their traditional knowledge. Yeah, I think that's so important, keeping traditional knowledge also at the forefront and the center of these initiatives. Um, my next question is for, thanks so much, Heidi, is for Dr. Malikian. Is that, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? You did, you did excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So you talked about food loss and waste, which is definitely an important issue uh, right now. We think about, you know, food systems, not just dietary behaviors. Uh, Can you provide a few more examples about how uh, food waste and food loss ties and intersects with cancer prevention? Sure. You know, uh, we work, as I said, we work with our farmers very closely and we see that some of them know how to uh, um, produce value added program and save those produce somehow and make money and have another avenue for that. But um, if we are having a lot of produce wasted, instead of going to the people that they need, as you saw the numbers that I gave for the state of Louisiana, people don't have access to it because if they had access, they would, they would buy it and they would eat it probably. So instead of throwing away that food waste that is not waste, uh, in my opinion, we can do a lot with it. You know, as I said, provided to, uh, for example, to food bank. Food bank can uh, distribute it to the people that they need. Uh, We are planning to have a garden in the neighborhood. And always my dream has been that we carry or deliver produce to the elderly. We know that they have limited way of traveling, you know, driving. After a while, you don't want to drive, especially right now with the pandemic that it's still hunting us. So those are the ways, or we can even, if we don't use it ourselves, we can give it to the plants. You know, we can uh, compost the produce that is wasted and make it, make sure that we are going by the right procedure, which we teach all that to our community members. 
then they can have their produce in a sustainable way. The key to all of the things that we are saying is sustainability. We may go to a neighborhood and provide uh, produce, you know, because we know it's good for them. It's going to reduce the cancer uh, or any other, you know, diseases. But if they don't have a sustainable way of having it every day, it's just luck for us. We have a saying, we say it's a helicopter uh, flight. You go land in an area, do what you want to do and you take off and you're gone. And then the next week, the people who you provided produce, they don't have anything and they don't have access to it. So one of the ways I think is with the community members, you have to actually make that they make them to trust you. And then when they trust you, they are gonna come into the uh, gatherings, they're gonna come into the activities and they're gonna have a community garden that they can exchange foods, they can exchange ideas, they can share recipes. And that's what we have been trying to do um, here, because as we said, it has taken a long time for the cancer to be shown and you know show its effect and we go to the doctor and all that. It takes a long, long time. It's gonna take a while for us to overcome that. And the sustainable way of approaching in my opinion, is one of the best ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so uh, I know we are running short on time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Toombs. Thank you, Dr. Odoms Young. And thank you all for those insightful questions and answers. We will now turn things back over to Dr. Jacobs Young for closing remarks. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Toombs and to Dr. Odoms Jung and all of our outstanding panelists. You've given us a wealth of information that will be invaluable in our efforts to help our families, friends, and communities make better food choices to help reduce the risk of cancer and other serious diseases. I'm inspired to action by all the speakers today, and I hope you are too. We heard from USDA scientists, expert university faculty members, and those in the community who shared their moving stories. I wanna circle back on the call to action for the day and let you know what I'm taking away for my actions. First, our call to action is to equip yourself with the latest information on nutrition and healthy eating as a part of, strat of a strategy for avoiding and healing from cancer. So as a result of the science I heard today, I take away that some aspects of cancer and recovery are in fact out of our control, but there are many ways to be empowered. And one of those opportunities is managing our nutrition and that it is never too late to start. The second action is to use the things we've learned today to educate our family and friends and help them prevent cancer one bite at a time. A tip I want to share with my family and friends, and my mom is connected today, so mom, I want you to hear this, is to substitute in just one healthy ingredient for a less healthy one in a favorite recipe to boost the health benefits of that dish. One step at a time is a great way to work toward big changes. I also want to take away that we don't have to be perfect to be successful. And third, each of us has a responsibility to help our communities as well as our families and friends. For this action, I am inspired even more than I was this morning to pursue the agenda of President Biden's cancer moonshot and USDA's nutrition security and precision nutrition. Working with the great researchers from USDA and our partners and community organizers and programs, cancer affects all of us. We all have a role to play in preventing cancer one bite at a time. That is just my personal to-do list. And I want us all to build on the great information that we acquired today and encourage you to check out additional resources available on USDA's Cancer Moonshot website. A few of my favorites are being dropped in the chat for you today, right now. The fact sheet on President Biden's Cancer Moonshot to end cancer as we know it, the recent USDA Nutrition Security Report, USDA Nutrition Research Factoids, 
and a variety of health and wellness resources from Federal Occupational Health. Now, don't forget to join the conversation. Social media campaign information is also being shared today. In closing, today's activities, let me again thank all of our participants and panelists. You have all made this a day of inspiration. For all of us, let's keep the momentum going. Share the information you learned today, share your stories, and let's all do our part to prevent cancer one bite at a time. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.